I have good news. After today's video, we will be done with the car section of the AMC sample test. So let's get right into it, passage nine. So let's scroll down. Looks like the name of this is The Reach of Imagination. Starts off, imagination is a specifically human gift. To imagine is the characteristic act, not of the poet's mind or the painter's or the scientist, but of the mind of man. So starting off good, imagination is a human characteristic. That's the first idea that we have come to. To imagine means to make images and to move them about inside one's head in new arrangements. When you and I recall the past, we imagine it in this direct and homely sense. The tool that puts the human mind ahead of the animal is imagery. So I think that um, the author just kind of defined imagination and this kind of just adds into the first paragraph. I am using the word image in a wide meaning which does not restrict it to the mind's eye as a visual organ. An image in my usage is what Charles Pierce called a sign without regard for its sensory quality. Indeed, the most important images for human beings are simply words which are abstract symbols. Okay, so so now we've come to kind of a new idea and it's a new um, definition of image. So it's not necessarily visual, but it can also be symbolic like words. Animals do not have words in our sense. There is no specific center for language in the brain of any animal as there is in the human being. In this respect, at least we know that the human imagination depends on a configuration in the brain that has only evolved in the last one or two million years. In the same period, evolution has greatly enlarged the frontal lobes of the human brain, which govern the sense of the past and the future, and it is a fair guess that they are probably the seat of our other images. Interesting that they mentioned past and future. I wonder if they are trying to basically say that those are also sim like symbolism and images and imagination. I think that uh, we just kind of added to the fact that um, these images are um, characteristically human and also get into a little bit of the neurobiology that perhaps the frontal lobe being so enlarged in humans is the reason why uh, we can imagine in this way. The images play out for us events which are not present to our senses and thereby guard the past and create the future, a future that does not yet exist and may never come to exist in that form. By contrast, the lack of symbolic ideas or their rudimentary poverty cuts off an animal from the past and the future alike and imprisons him in the present. Of all the distinctions between man and animal, the characteristic gift which makes us human is the power to work with symbolic images, the gift of imagination. So I think that we have confirmed that the author believes past and present and future to all be kind of forms of imagination and just really drilling in this idea that animals cannot do this. It is specifically human. This is really a remarkable finding with Philip Sidney in 1580 defended poets and all unconventional thinkers from the Puritan charge that they were liars. He said that a maker must imagine things that are not. Halfway between Sydney and us, William Blake said what is now proved was once only imagined. About the same time in 1796, Samuel Taylor Coleridge for the first time distinguished between the passive fancy and the active imagination, the living power and prime agent of all human perception. Now we see that they were right and precisely right. The human gift is the gift of imagination, and that is not just a literary phrase. So this seems to be uh, the author just mentioning historical figures that have kind of had the same idea as he does. Nor is it just a literary gift. It is, I repeat, characteristically human. We get it, bro. Almost everything that we do that is worth doing is done in the first place in the blind's eye. The richness of human life is that we have many lives. We live the events that do not happen and some that cannot as vividly as those that do. And if thereby we die a thousand deaths, that is the price we pay for living a thousand lives. I would get that tattooed on me. Literature is alive to us because we live its images, but so is any play of the mind. So is chess. The lines of play that we foresee and try in our heads and dismiss are as much a part of the game as the moves we make. So to me, this paragraph we just read kind of goes into that paragraph where it's talking about the past and the future and creating a future that does not exist and may never come to exist in that form. I have described imagination as the ability to make images and to move them about inside one's head in new arrangements. This is the faculty that is specifically human and it is the common root from which science and literature both spring and grow and flourish together. So that's an interesting end to the passage because that's kind of a new idea that this is kind of a springboard where we can add imagination and science, the things that are reality to us, and grow both of those fields. So if I was going to have a main idea, I would say something along the lines of this. Imagery is a human gift which opens life to the past, future, and things that will never occur, pushing humans forward.
imagery is a human gift is kind of the immature main idea. It is the undercurrent of the entire passage, and it is said over and over and over by the author. I think that this whole past, future, and things that will never occur was a pretty important idea because it was reiterated in a couple different uh, paragraphs that were set apart from each other. And then this last idea, pushing humans forward, was kind of what I gathered from this last sentence talking about combining it with science. Straight into the questions, 48 says, according to the passage, an image is a versatile tool that... So the author spent some time talking about what they believe images to be and what they do not believe images to be. And they specifically said that they were not uh, limited to the eye as a visual organ right here, that they could be symbols like language and words. So that logic aligns with answer choice B the best. The author did not limit it to visual, did not limit it to abstract, and definitely did say that images are visual and abstract at some point. 49 says an experiment found that dogs can remember a new signal for only five minutes, whereas six-year-old children can remember the same signal much longer. Based on the information in the passage, this finding is probably explained by the fact that... So the author went into pretty good detail about how humans and animals are different. And how are they different? Humans can imagine and have symbolism and imagery and animals do not. So we want something that aligns with the passage on that, but that also answers the question as to why a six-year-old child can remember a signal much longer than dogs. So go into these answer choices fully thinking about what aligns with the passage. A, a human being possesses a larger store of symbolic images than a dog possesses. That does go in line with the passage. It would also answer the question because if a child had a larger store of symbolic images than a dog, then they could make more connections in their brain and that may solidify that memory more. B, the human brain evolved more quickly than the brain of a dog. The passage did talk a little bit about the evolution of the human brain over one or two million years, but I don't know if that's quickly. I don't know how quickly the dog's brain developed. So it would be a pretty good logical leap to think that this was the right answer. See, the children were probably much older than the dogs. That's an assumption and that might not be correct. And can a 10-year-old dog remember more than a six-year-old child? No. D, most dogs are colorblind. That doesn't make any sense. Um, that doesn't have anything to do with memory. So A is the right answer. 50, which of the following findings would most weaken the claim that the use of symbolic imagery is unique to humans? So that was the author's main claim throughout the entire passage. So we're looking for something that's opposite of that, something that would weaken the entire passage, likely. A, chimpanzees are capable of learning at least some sign language. Though a chimpanzee is an animal, and the author stated over and over and over that animals do not have the ability to use symbolism or images and one of those images that the author mentioned was language. So to say that these chimpanzees can learn some language would be in opposition to the passage. So I like that one. B, certain species of birds are able to migrate great distances by instinct alone. The passage never touched on instinct. Um, I don't think that the author would argue that animals don't have instinct. If the birds were reading a map and then planning a route, that would be different. That would be using symbolism. But by instinct alone, I don't think so. See, human beings have larger frontal lobes than do other animals. If anything, that would be uh, right in accordance with what the author was saying. It would not weaken the claim. D, some animals have brains that are larger than human brains. So that may be true, but the size of the brain is not equal to the use of symbolic imagery. So that's not necessarily weakening the claim like A is. 51, it has been said that language does not merely describe reality, but actually helps to bring reality into existence, which of the points made in the passage would best support this claim. So automatically I'm thinking of that line in the passage talking about images creating the future. So let's find something in these answer choices that kind of aligns with that. A, to imagine means to make images and move them about in one's head. But that doesn't really talk about bringing reality into existence at all. B, the tool that puts the human mind ahead of the animals is imagery. Again, doesn't really talk about bringing reality into existence. C, there's no specific center for language in the brain of any animal except the human being. Again, not talking about this last part. It's, they're all missing that last part about bringing reality into existence. D, images play out events that are not present, thereby guarding the past and creating the future. So that's what I was looking for. Language is a type of image 
And then creating the future would be like bringing reality into existence. So that's the best answer there. 52, in order to defend poets from the charge that they were liars, Sydney noted in paragraph six that a maker must imagine things that are not. Sydney's point is that, so this was the uh, point in the passage where that Sydney person in like the 1500s was trying to defend the poets and saying that poets have an imagination that they are using but if imagination makes a liar, then everyone's a liar because any, even a blacksmith or a maker of any sorts has to imagine, um, you know, the end product that they're working towards. So everyone has a sort of imagination. A, a true poet must possess a powerful imagination. So I'd be wary of saying that to a Puritan that was trying to call a poet a liar. I don't think I would reiterate how strong their imagination was. B, in order to create something, one must first imagine it. So that is very much in line with this specific quote. And so I like that answer choice. C, poets are the most creative people in our society. Again, I think I would stray away from saying that to a Puritan trying to call a poet a liar. D, imagination is not a gift unique to poets, but is possessed by all creative people. This one's an okay answer. Um, I don't like that it says all creative people. I think it's just all people, period. And while that may have been a larger point that Sydney was making, I think that this specific quote is the point that in order to create something, one must first imagine it. I think B is just a better answer. 53, in the context of the passage, the statement in paragraph 7, if thereby we die a thousand deaths, that is the price we pay for living a thousand lives, is most likely to meant to suggest that. So that was in one of those later paragraphs where the author was talking about all these different scenarios that we can live, but that we don't end up living. Those are all in our mind's eye, or they're all in our imagination. And so the the act of not living out those realities is what he refers to as a death. But the fact that we ever get to live them out in our mind's eye at all is a life. And I think that the author is saying that it is worth dying a thousand deaths. It is worth not being able to live out all the realities that we are able to think of in our mind to be able to think about them in our mind. A says we must guard against using our imaginations towards destructive ends. So I think that that takes the word death a little bit too literally here. It's not talking about um, any, that's not destructive. That's not like the death of our bodies. That's just the death of like a possible reality. B says, although imagination sometimes causes pain, its positive out aspects outweigh its negative ones. So yeah, that's right in line. That's what I was saying. Dying a thousand deaths is the pain, but living a thousand lives is the positive aspect. See, it is possible to be too imaginative for one's own good. So I think that this is not in line with the tone of the passage. I think the tone of the passage was that the author was very pro-imagination, and I don't think that the author would be saying that it's possible to be too imaginative for one's own good. And I also don't think that that's what that quote is saying. D says, without imagination, the uniquely human awareness of death would not exist. Again, I think that's taking death just a little bit too literally. It's not talking about the death of our bodies. So B is the best answer here. That so we are officially done with the car section of the sample test. I hope that you guys find these videos helpful. If you do, leave a like and hit subscribe so that you don't miss our videos in the future. Until next time.